Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doris Barta, and I'm the director of the National Telehealth Technology Assessment Center. And on behalf of myself and my colleague, Jordan Berg, we are, we are excited to be able to provide a virtual telehealth technology showcase for you through the Northeast Mid-Atlantic Virtual Telehealth Conference. So let me share a little bit about who we are. TTAC is federally funded through the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. We are one of two of the National Telehealth Resource Centers. The other one is a policy TRC, and we are the technology TRC. Now, as you know, Kathy and Danielle run two of the, the regional telehealth resource centers, two of the 12 regional telehealth resource centers. And our primary service is to provide technology assessment for the regional telehealth resource centers, as well as any other individual or organization that is looking for information regarding telehealth technology. There are three members of our staff. Garrett Spargo, who is our PI, is looking into Jordan's eye in this picture. Jordan is our technology specialist and myself. And between the three of us, we have over 50 years experience in the telehealth arena. Now, we also wanted to share with you that we are members of the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers, the NCTRC, as well as the 12 regional and the other national TRC. And between all of us, we have a number of resources that are on the National TRC website, which is www.telehealthresourcecenter.org. So we encourage you to go onto that website and get some of the information that is there if you're looking for resources centered around either creating a telemedicine program or perhaps extending services that you already have on your existing telehealth program. So this is an actual map that is on the NCTRC website, and this is an interactive map. So if you are from the Northeast TRC or Mid-Atlantic, all you have to do is click on that map where they, where they are at, and it'll take you to contact information for either Kathy or Danielle. Now, you can also re reach out to any one of the other regional TRCs by clicking on that state and you will get that contact information as well. Now, if you wanted to contact one of the two national TRCs, all you have to do is click on their logo and it'll take you to that, their contact information too. So we really encourage you to use the ENC TRC website when you have an opportunity. <clears throat> So one of the many things that, T, that, that uh, TTAC does is we provide technology showcases. For the last several years, we have provided technology showcases in person at both the NETRC and the Maytree conferences. Unfortunately, this year, as you know, because of COVID, we've not been able to gather together physically. So today we are going to provide you with a virtual technology showcase. Now, one of the things that we want to remind all of you is that TTAC is vendor neutral. And so what we are doing today is just showing you the technology, but we're not making any decisions with regards to the technology. We are leaving that up to you. So an overview of the, of the um, showcase today, we will be demonstrating technology that is used in telemedicine today. We will be focusing on technology as it relates to the COVID-19 crisis and how that has influenced trends and in platform uses for, for providing telemedicine care. We will pro be providing live demonstrations on video and audio solutions. We will discuss features on three exam cameras and we'll provide video demonstration clips. We will talk about electronic stethoscopes and how they're used in vital virtual care. We will demonstrate how mobile health or M-Health peripherals are changing how telemedicine is provided, especially in the direct-to-consumer telemedicine, and we have a demonstration of augmented reality. Now, augmented reality is one of the funnest things that we usually do during face-to-face -face interactions, but unfortunately, we can't do that today. 
but we do have a video clip of an individual using a piece of augmented reality for their very first time. And finally, we will leave you with some thoughts about technology and telemedicine before we take your questions. So what are some of the key features on telemedicine? The telemedicine world has experienced COVID-19 as both a disrupting and reinforcing force in the telemedicine market. <clears throat> now, Jordan and I are sure that you aren't surprised at all about the huge increase in telemedicine since the advent of the crisis. Organizations are getting into technology, functionality, and trying to set up as quickly as possible. And there is an increased interest in providing services to the patient in their home. For example, a colleague of mine and I were talking the other day, and he told me that 100% of their pediatric providers are doing telemedicine now. And 99% of their adult providers are doing telemedicine now. So they have gone from 1,200 vi virtual encounters a week to over 4,400 uh, vir a month to over 44,000 virtual encounters a month. So you can see how, you know, the explosion of telemedicine has occurred with just this one organization since the crisis began. So for specifically for video-based telemedicine, here are a few key, few key features that should be considered in your selection process. And we have some key concerns that also need to be addressed or at least understood. So with web-based, COVID-19 has moved many programs towards web-based video platforms because they can be set up quickly. While this is not a new trend, we have been tracking this for a while and it has increased exponentially since the beginning of the COVID crisis. Direct to patient. The biggest change that we are seeing is the rapid use of the patient home as a care, care location. Now this means that we're using the patient's equipment, like their cell phone, their iPad, their computer, and we are using the consumer grade Wi-Fi and mobile networks. It also means that the platforms they are connecting with need to have con simple collect connection methods like email, text message, or through a patient portal. To that end, we are seeing more patients and providers expressing an interest in solutions that operate without the patient having to download an application so that they can use it. And we're seeing more and more use of mobile platforms. Jordan has a number of mobile platforms that he will be sharing with you today and these are technologies that are designed to be used on a tablet or a cell phone. So let's talk a little bit about some of the concerns that we have with regards to telemedicine platforms. The COVID-19 has served as a stress test that telemedicine capabilities of organization, service providers, and vendors. It has made us focus on several key features that are necessary to rapidly deploy or rapidly scale your services. So when we look at deployability, how quickly can that new service or expanded service be deployed into your clinical environment? If you purchase a new platform or device, how soon will you be able to use it in patient care? Scalability. How rapidly can you move from seeing a dozen, dozen patients a week to 100 or more patients a week via telemedicine? Does your, network does your network support this spike in traffic? Do you have enough software licenses to cover the spike in demand? Reliability. If you get a new service or device, how reliable will it be for actual patient care over time and ease of use? In addition to all of this, there are so many more providers and patients using this technology, some that never have considered using telemedicine previously. Having products that are simple to use and easy to train on is vital in delivering care that doesn't get bogged down by technological issues. And in the middle of all of this, we need to constantly be thinking about securing privacy, security and privacy in telemedicine. And that's why we have that right in the middle of the screen of all of those other concerns. With regards to security and privacy, we are seeing two forces 
affecting security and privacy during the COVID-19 crisis. One is a relaxation of some of the HIPAA compliance and other regulations around platforms that can be used to deliver patient care. This has allowed clinicians and patients to connect and be reimbursed using non-traditional technologies. The Office of Civil Rights has published a notice about the types of technologies that are and are not appropriate for patient care. They spe specifically mention FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, video chat, Google Hangouts, Zoom, and Skype as platforms that could be used although they do admit that this is not an exhausted list. They also mention platforms that should not be used, like Facebook Live, Twitch, and TikTok. Generally speaking, if the platform is designed primarily for broadcast or, or one-to-many communications, it is not a viable telemedicine platform under the discretionary notice. Overall, this relaxation of privacy rules is sure to be a temporary measure, and once a pandemic is over, programs will need to adjust their care to more secure platforms. We are also seeing some concerns raised over high volume video service providers in relation to security and privacy. Some of these issues are related to users not understanding the tools that are built into the products they are using, or perhaps the organizations are not es establishing a set effective procedures and controls for video conferencing. Other issues point to a deeper problem in the way some of these video providers handle their data. Regardless, we are seeing some growing pains as organizations, vendors, and, con and consumers deal with these new ways of seeking and securing delivery of care. So with video conferencing hardware, Video conferencing hardware is by far the most common way telemedicine care is delivered, whether directly to the patient in their home or in a local cl clinic setting using live video solutions like the ones that we are talking about today. <clears throat> they are useful tools in the delivery of virtual healthcare. Some of the major changes in video conferencing over the last five years have now been moving towards cloud-based video conferencing platforms. Also, video usage has moved towards low-cost laptops or de desktop solutions, and the peripherals they are using provide audio and video for these visits through a USB plug-and-play camera and audio solution. So for our demonstration today, we wanted to show you these various web-based video conferencing endpoints, what they look like to the end user. Pay particular attention to the field of view, the color accuracy, and the overall clarity of the audio and video. So one of our greatest tools for assessing video and audio quality are our ears and our eyes. We want to show you a quick demonstration of three different integrated audio and video solutions so that you can get a chance to hear and see some of the features for yourself. I will briefly introduce each platform and Jordan will demonstrate the technology. So the first video platform we are going to demonstrate for you is a Logitech Meetup. The Meetup is an all-in-one USB plug-and-play video camera that has a built-in pan, tilt, zoom functionality, speakers, and a microphone. It also supports an extension microphone puck that can be used to capture audio for the center of the room. So now Jordan is going to demonstrate for you the Logitech Meetup. Thanks, Doris. So this is a demonstration of the audio and video capabilities of the Logitech Meetup. Um, one of the unique features about this setup is that it actually has a built-in motorized pan tilt zoom camera. So you can see um, as I actually pan across the room, it also has a built-in digital zoom and a couple of presets that really help with uh, framing uh, common areas of a room that you want to capture. Like a lot of the solutions that we're looking at today, or two of the solutions that we're looking at today, it has an extension microphone so that you can actually capture sounds uh, that are happening in the center of a room uh, and you can get a, a clearer understanding of what you're seeing and hearing in a patient environment. Back to you, Doris. Thank you, Jordan. So now the next camera system that we are going to share with you is a Poly Studio. 
It uses a large digital sensor to capture a wide field of view and also allows a user to pan within the digital image. Like the Meetup, it has a built-in microphone and speakers, and it is able to support extension microphones. So now Jordan is going to demonstrate the Poly Studio. Thank you, Doris. So up next, we have the Poly Studio. It has a little bit of a wider field of view um, than we saw in a Logitech Meetup. Um, unlike the uh, Logitech Meetup, there is no mechanic, uh, me mechanical pan tilt zoom feature on this. So all of the pan tilt zoom uh, happens digitally. So if, if I zoom in a little bit on the image here, oh, we're in a little, little bit of trouble with the, the here. Um, so we're able to actually pan within the larger uh, field of view uh, with this device. One of the interesting things that this device does is in addition to having a speaker uh, pod, like on the Logitech Meetup that we can capture a, a additional space in the room, we can also well, it's a speaker tracking feature. So if I move over to the side here out of field of view of the camera, the camera will eventually find my voice and reframe the picture to capture the speaker who's speaking. I can move over to this side of the room as well, and eventually the, the camera will actually reframe based on where I'm at. So it's these sorts of um, kind of all-in-one USB plug-and-play devices that allow us to um, more easily get boardroom level features uh, for video conferencing systems in a room-based uh, plug-and-play USB format. Back to you, Doris. Okay, thank you, Jordan. And the last video system that we want to share with you is the Meeting Owl. So we are seeing solutions that combine audio and unique video capabilities into one unit. The Meeting Owl provides a 360 view and robust audio. This device is designed to sit in the middle of a group of speakers and the camera can automatically focus and slice the image to show who is speaking. This is great if you're doing a, a group meeting or a, a group session with, with a patient and their family. And um, it, it's, it's, like I said, it's designed to sit in the middle of a table. And so now Jordan is going to share with you the meeting room owl. So thank you, Doris. So as you can see here, we have the meeting room owl. Uh, and this is a little bit of a unique device in that instead of um, capturing with a, a wide field of view lens or having a motorized pan tilt zoom, um, it actually has a 360 degree uh, lens up at the top of the device. And that top view is actually the full image that is being captured by the lens. You can see as I walk around the room, the camera will uh, slice that larger image and provide a view of the individuals that are speaking. If multiple individuals are speaking in a room, it will actually split that smaller image into multiple different frames so you can see multiple speakers at once. So this uh, camera is designed to sit in the middle of a group of speakers um, and be able to show everyone in a room. Um, so it's good for group sessions or sessions where you have multiple speakers on one end that you want people to be able to interact with multiple speakers at the same time. Back to you, Doris. Thank you, Jordan. So now what we wanted to do is just show you a comparison of a still taken by each one of these separate cameras. So we are in Jordan's living room and each one of these were taken at the same day, on the same day, at the same time. So we just wanted to give you a visualization of how each one of these cameras takes a, a snapshot of just-in-time video. So now the next group of, of medical peripheral equipment that we want to share with you are exam cameras. Now the USB exam cameras provide a way for the far side provider to get a closer view of their patient. These cameras are designed to function like a webcam, so you can pull them up on your, your, on your video software. Many cameras will have an, in, interchangeable lenses, so you can provide other functionality like an otoscope and a dermatology image. Some of these cameras also have built-in storage so that you can capture an image for later review or transmission. Others only stream, but they may have the ability to pause a view on screen. 
There are multiple devices from numerous manufacturers on the market. And this cost and the cost for these devices can range from a few hundred dollars to several thousand dollars. Jordan will demonstrate the layout and features of three of these devices, and you will also see recordings demonstrating, demonstrating some of the functionality of these devices. So now Jordan will, will share with you, if I can stop sharing here, share with you the first of the exam cameras. Thanks, Doris. So first up on the table, we have the DE605. So this is a uh, exam camera from Firefly, um, and it is uh, a USB plug and play device. It features a manual focus wheel up here on the top so that can be adjusted with your thumb by rotating there. It also has a built-in polarization filter that's activated by rotating this section above the housing right here. So you can apply polarized, um, uh, it, uh, you can apply polarization to an image that you're capturing. Inside the device itself, um, there is an image capture button um, here on the device, but you're gonna need to use the Firefly Pro software included with the camera. So using that in a live video conferencing uh, uh, situation might be a little bit challenging to do. But the variable brightness for the device um, will work regardless of how you have the solution set up. And there's four different steps of variable brightness that you can step through. Pricing for this unit is about $500. And this camera is designed primarily for live streaming of exam cam images. Next, we have a short video showing test images captured with this Firefly DE605. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Firefly DE605 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 36 inches or three feet from the camera lens. Note how the manual focus needs to be adjusted for objects to be seen clearly. Images taken from this distance are useful for visualizing the anatomic location of complaints and for assessing movement. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Firefly DE605 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 12 to 18 inches from the camera lens. These sorts of views are useful for dermatology, neurological, and general exam purpose imaging. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Firefly DE605 to capture images of test objects at a distance of 3 to 4 inches from the camera lens. This view is useful for viewing details like eyes, rashes or lesions, interoral imaging, dermatology, neurological, and general exam. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Firefly DE605 to capture skin detail. Using the manual focus ring, we can adjust the image until the desired skin features are clear. As we turn the polarization ring, we can see as the shine and depth is removed from the image for better color detail. Turning the filter back returns the shine and depth of the original image. 
So now the next um, camera that Jordan is going to demonstrate for you is uh, Horus 3 made by Jedmed. Thanks, Doris. So next up, we have the uh, Horus 3 by Jedmed. Um, this is the new Horus uh, model, um, it, uh, just recently out from them. It's a USB exam camera. Um, it features general um, uh, interchangeable general exam lens and otoscope lens. Um, unlike the previous autofocus model, this one actually has a manual focus uh, ring here on the bottom. Um, this makes it easier to dial in otoscope images or skin detail and get a, a, a clearer picture in a lot of different cases. The built-in light source is variable based on which lens that we have attached, and the test screen provides a guide for not only framing our images, but it can also be used to review captured images on the device. Um, and you also use the touch screen to adjust onboard settings. It features a locking cable um, for both HDMI, um, so this is a mini HDMI, and for USB 3, um, with a contact charging um, for this device as well. Pricing for this unit is around $5,000 with both the otoscope and exam camera lenses. Camera is designed for both capturing video and still images and can be used for live streaming exam camera images. In our next video, um, we have a short uh, uh, demonstration of images captured with this particular device. In this demonstration, we'll show the ability of the Horus 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 36 inches or 3 feet from the camera lens. Note how the manual focus needs to be adjusted to focus on the test objects. Images taken from this distance are useful for visualizing anatomic locations of complaints and for assessing movement. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Horus 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 12 to 18 inches from the camera lens. This view is useful for dermatology, neurological, and general exam purpose imaging. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Horus 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 3 to 4 inches. This view is useful for viewing details like eyes, rashes or lesions, interoral images, and dermatology, neurological, and general exam purposes. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Horus 3 to capture skin detail. Holding the camera about 4 inches away, we manually focus to acquire the desired skin features. At this point, we can take a still image that will pause the live feed and store an image to the device for closer observation. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Horus 3 to capture imagery of the tympanic membrane.
After switching to the otoscope lens, we move the scope into the ear canal where we can see the tympanic membrane. Using the manual focus wheel, we can ensure that all structures are in focus. We can now take a still image, deposit the live feed, and store an image to the device for closer observation. So now the third camera that Jordan is going to share with you is a total exam three. Thanks, Doris. So the last camera we have for you is the Total Exam 3 by Global Med. So again, this is a USB exam camera featuring interchangeable general exam and otoscope lenses. It has built-in autofocus and it has the ability to manually white balance um, for better color accuracy. The, the head of this camera can pivot down to provide a more natural angle for capturing otoscope images. It features a freeze frame button for pausing live images on the screen. And if you press that again, it'll resume the image. The built-in light source is variable depending on which attachment you have, or which lens you have attached to the device. Pricing for this unit is about $7,500 with both lenses. And this camera is designed primarily for live streaming exam camera images and does not have any sort of internal storage for capturing images, um, the, uh, capturing live images. In the next video, we will show some of the images that we're able to capture with the Total Exam 3. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 36 inches or three feet from the camera lens. Note how the camera is able to automatically focus on the different objects. Images taken from this distance are useful for visualizing anatomic locations of complaints and for assessing movement. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of about 12 to 18 inches from the camera lens. These sorts of views are useful for dermatology, neurological, and general exam imaging. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture images of test objects at a distance of 3 to 4 inches from the camera lens. This view can be useful for viewing details like eyes, rashes or lesions, interoral images, dermatology, neurology, and general purposes. In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture skin detail. First, we balance the camera on a piece of white paper to ensure color accuracy. Holding the camera about 4 inches away allows the autofocus to acquire the desired skin features. At this point, the freeze frame function for this device is useful in pausing the image for closer observation.
In this demonstration, we will show the ability of the Total Exam 3 to capture imagery of the tympanic membrane. After switching to the otoscope lens, we are able to white balance the image on a piece of paper. Moving the scope into the ear canal, we can see the tympanic membrane. We can use the freeze frame function to pause the image for closer observation. So now the next group of technologies that we would like to share with you are stethoscopes. So live stethoscopy can be used to listen to a patient's heart and lung sounds at a distance. Most, most stethoscopes will require separate software to transmit the sounds to the far end user. Now often stethoscopes are supported by software from multiple different developers. So it's often worthwhile for you to take a look at a variety of software solutions before you make your selections. Most stethoscopes will, require, will connect via a PC computer using either USB Bluetooth or microphone jack connectors. Recently, we've also seen a rise in stethoscopes that can, directly, can connect directly to mobile devices, turning these devices into mobile stethoscope platforms. There's also been a trend to have a single lead ECG embedded into the stethoscope chest piece. So now Jordan is going to share with you um, the various stethoscopes. Thanks, Doris. So first up here on the table, we have the Littman 3200. So this is a, a pretty common uh, stethoscope that's used in telemedicine uh, for a variety of different platforms. It has um, a lot of onboard controls, um, including, um, it's, so it's a, uh, first of all, it's a Bluetooth stethoscope, so it connects wirelessly. Um, so you'll need some sort of software to capture that Bluetooth signal and transmit it uh, across the internet to whoever you want to have listen to that. It has onboard volume controls, onboard filtering, including bell and diaphragm, and the ability to record strips directly to the device. It's powered by a single AA battery inside the housing here, and it uses a traditional stethoscope style earpiece. Next up, we have the JedMed Omnisteth. So this device is a little bit unique in that it has interchangeable heads so that you can switch between a pediatric or a, an adult um, stethoscopy head. It has onboard volume controls, like the Lipman 3200, it's a built in, and the ability to record strips directly to the device. This is also powered by AA batteries, and we have the ability to either use the traditional style uh, earpieces, or we can uh, disconnect the um, earpieces from the housing and insert a connector that will allow us to connect a standard set of headphones. In order to use this device for telemedicine at this point, you would actually need to use that headphone connector to use that line out so that you can actually stream this through whatever telemedicine platform you're using. The final stethoscope we wanna show you today is the Echo Duo. So Doris was talking about devices that are designed to be used with mobile, um, like an iPad or an I, uh, iPhone or an Android device. So the Echo Duo is designed to be used either using their Android or iOS app. Volume is adjustable through the side clicker here. And filtering is, uh, there's filtering capability that can be changed through the central wheel indicator. Recording and streaming is supported through the Echo app. And the supplied traditional set of earpieces can be removed from the housing and as standard a headphone jack can be used as well. On the underside of the device, we see the two metal plates that we use for the single lead ECG. This device is a built-in rechargeable battery and recharges using a wireless charging cradle. Back to you, Doris. Thanks, Jordan. So now the next group of technologies that we'd like to share with you are mHealth devices. There has been a rapid increase in both the quality and variety of mobile health or mHealth devices that are entering in the telemedicine market, especially during this COVID-19 crisis. These devices can support a variety of workflows, but most will share some common key features. 
Generally, they will connect to a smart device like a phone or a tablet. They will be accessible through an app on the device. They may or may not support medical peripheral de devices. And the medical information collected by these devices is generally stored in a centralized uh, place like the cloud. So in the following overview demonstration, Jordan is going to show you a few examples of VIM Health technology. Jordan? Thanks, Doris. So first up, we have the uh, Dermalite Dermatoscope. So this device can serve as a standalone dermatoscope, so we can actually use it just using the eyepiece. But um, what makes this an mHealth device is we can actually pair it with uh, the iPhone case here that has a magnetic ring. We simply connect uh, to the device with that magnetic ring, and then we're able to capture images through the app on the device. The device supports variable light brightness, has a polarization filter, and a manual focus ring. The next M Health device that we want to show you today is the Tido Care. So this is one of the devices that we're seeing that are really targeted at patients in their homes. It is a handheld multi-purpose examination device. It has interchangeable heads and built-in sensors that allow it to collect stethoscope sounds using the stethoscope chest piece here, including heart, lung, and bowel sounds. On the actual body of the device, we have sensors for collecting heart rate, temperature, and exam cam images. It has a built-in screen, and it connects to an iPhone or an Android app. Um, and the screen is designed to really guide the patients through how to perform an exam, and then capture and send that information through the smartphone to a provider service. There are a variety of different business models that can be supported by the Tido Care. Um, a common one is uh, the device can be purchased by consumers from, um, from Best Buy for about $300, um, and that is actually uh, tied into the provider service of Tido Care. So, um, organizations can also purchase uh, devices for uh, distribution to consumers, or there's also a provider version that has a lot less of the guidance that's built into the system, um, but uh, can be used for capturing clinical images inside of a clinical environment. The final device that we want to show you today is the Butterfly IQ. So the Butterfly IQ is a polar portable ultrasound that's designed to connect to an iPad or an iPhone using this lightning connector. Most of the functionality for this device comes in through the, the um, Butterfly IQ app. So you're able to use a variety of different uh, ultrasound modes um, and then uh, and um, sensitivities that you adjust through the app. The app can record those exams, can capture stills from those exams, and send that information to another provider. We have a quick uh, brief video demonstration showing uh, images that we've captured with this device. This is a demonstration of the Butterfly Mobile Ultrasound. The ultrasound footage was recorded from inside the Butterfly app on an iPad. Using the vascular access preset and the color Doppler setting, we are able to visualize arteries and veins within a subject's forearms. This demonstration shows that mobile tablets are becoming robust telemedicine platforms able to support a variety of peripherals and workflows. So one of our so now, favorite, oh go ahead sorry go ahead sorry so one, <laughs> go ahead one of our favorite uh, pieces of technology we like to demonstrate um, in the um, technology showcase has been our augmented reality headsets so um, a lot of people have heard about virtual reality um, and fewer people have heard about augmented reality but that's kind of changing all the time um, over the last three years augmented reality has become a more and more practical tool with potential telemedicine applications. And we've actually seen it being used um, pretty effectively uh, as a uh, way to distance providers um, in COVID-19 care situations. So augmented reality differs from virtual reality in that instead of existing in a completely virtualized environment, 
um, where the user is surrounded by digital information and, and they don't, don't, don't see the real world around them. Uh, an augmented reality headset actually applies digital information to the real world. One of the advantages of doing this is because you're actually looking through a set of clear lenses, you're actually able to um, experience the real world around you and you don't have the disorientation that you can sometimes have um, with a virtual reality headset. Headsets like these um, continue to become more powerful, more comfortable and affordable. This particular one is the Microsoft HoloLens um, and there's actually a new generation of HoloLens that are out on the market. Um, right now that are uh, much more powerful, much more compact, and more comfortable to use. Potential applications for this technology are in the realms of radiology, um, surgical guidance, emergency medicine, training, patient provider education, and then I said, as I said before, um, we've seen it being used in COVID care as well. So we're seeing more and more feasible applications to being developed for this technology, and more and more programs begin to look at how they can um, and implement this innovative technology into their workflows. Um, we really believe that this is one of the areas telemedicine will continue to expand to in the coming years. Um, we do want to share with you a quick demonstration of what this augmented reality technology looks like through the eyes of a user. This is a demonstration of a HoloLens user's recent experience at a T-TAC technology demonstration. In this recording, the user is able to visualize a 3D mannequin overlaid with anatomical information. The user can walk around, lean into, and otherwise interact with this object. Augmented reality allows digital information to be inserted into the real world and is one of the technologies to watch for the future of telemedicine. Pretty cool, huh? <clears throat> now you can see why we really enjoy being able to share the um, aug augmented reality um, systems with, with people when we're together. So we have some final thoughts for you. First of all, we have thoughts with, with that we like to mention every time we do a technology showcase. And then the second set of thoughts are with regard specifically to telemedicine and COVID-19. So it is important that the technology chosen should support the needs and the workflow of the organization, and it must be supported by the users. Technology for the sake of technology alone usually ends up in a drawer covering dust, or like we used to say, it's used for a lab coat hanger. Spend, time on, spend some time using the technology before you buy it. And that can make a real difference between whether or not you have a successful telemedicine program or not. Most vendors will allow you to trial their equipment for up to 30 days, and we really advise you to do so. And finally, make sure that you get your whole team bought into the technology. Your clinical staff, your administration, and your IT department all have differing views on what makes a good telemedicine system. Make sure you collect the data and make sure you demonstrate it and communicate it amongst all of the members before you, before you buy. This is vital in developing a successful telemedicine program. And our final final thoughts are this. Although the previous thoughts are just as much true during the COVID-19 pandemic, we also wanted to add some specific thoughts about how the use of telemedicine technology has changed over the last few months. So COVID requires a flexible but robust response. Telemedicine is a great tool for reaching existing patients that we can no longer see in person or for working with patients who are affected by the virus. This means we will be seeing patients in their home, on their mobile devices, 
using their consumer grade internet and mobile connections. It is important to be flexible, text, test, test connectivity when we can, and have backup options for when things don't work. Reassuring the patients and the providers that this flexibility is a part of the plan can really help mitigate frustration. As we expand delivery of care using telemedicine, telemedicine we are also expanding our risk. Unfortunately, this COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the challenge in getting new technologies to new users and patients. It can be challenging to determine how potential partners are defining and managing risk on their ends. It is important that even in a crisis, we make every effort to train and educate users using the technologies we use, the controls we have in place, and the importance of their role in security and privacy. It is also important to work with our technology partners to make sure that we have an understanding and an insight into those risks. To use an analogy, telemedicine technology is a power tool, and we are handing this tool to our patients and our providers. If we can ensure they understand how to safely operate this tool, we can help build useful care models. If we don't, we can cause much more harm than good. We need to have frank conversations with our technology partners to make sure that we have a common understanding of shared risks. Security and privacy is not a checkbox. It is a daily discipline. And finally, unfortunately, we are living in a time where just-in-time solutions are important. But it's also important that as we select our technologies and plan our care models, we are thinking about how these solutions are going to work for us a year from now or even five years from now. As providers, patients, and health systems rely on telemedicine to solve current problems, we can expect them to re rely on telemedicine in the future. What we build today is what we are going to be using tomorrow. So this is how you can contact TTAC. You can contact us at our, at our website, which is tele, tele, telehealthtechnology.org, or the phone number down below. We have numerous toolkits on our website that you can access. We have numerous papers, assessments on the various technologies that we've shared with you today. So please look at our website or contact us. Um, at this phone number we have below. And before we take the questions, we just want to remind you that you have an opportunity to rate this session. And please do so. It helps the program planners um, develop their planning for future sessions. So now we would like to say thank you for giving Jordan and me the opportunity to share with you today we're via the virtual telehealth showcase. And now we'll open up the floor to questions. So it looks like we have, um, so Jordan, in the past there were, was an in, initiative called Comparative Effectiveness Research, which was federal, federal, and of course there is a consumers union which compares stuff we use for program, programs relative to cost. Is your group moving towards evaluation, then rating, then recommending the best of the best, especially for patient use and integration to the total health record? So TTAC's at an interesting spot in that um, we are vendor neutral, so we can't make a recommendation. Um, we can't tell you this is the best exam cam, go buy this exam cam. Um, what we're more interested in doing, and I think what is a more useful tool for folks is we'd like to teach people how to evaluate telemedicine technology. Um, one of the challenges that we see in a lot of situations is that um, the care models that people are supporting are just very different. And what is actually a good tool in one situation won't necessarily be a good tool in another. And we really want to make sure that people know how to bring in technology, how to assess it themselves, how to figure out what their needs are, figure out what their use case is, do the market research, bring in the technology, test it, get their providers to look at it, sign off on it, and then move forward. Um, a lot of information on our website is really about that process. How do I evaluate technology? How do I do that? So we're not going to be able to kind of rate or 
really give you a hierarchical list of the different technologies. What we try to do though, is when we do an evaluation, we try to provide kind of the raw images or the raw data that we collected and allow you to use that as kind of a jumping off point for your own research. So, so um, uh, we're, not, we're not going to um, kind of give you a one, two, three, these are the best things that you need to look at, but um, really look at it from the lens of what kind of care do you want to deliver? How do you plan to deliver it? And what are the needs of your organization? Um, and that can give you a good jumping off point in terms of telemedicine assessment. The other thing too, I just wanted to add that if you have more than one individual, you have a group of people who want to discuss a certain technology, we can set up a video call like this one here and we can follow up with you um, and, and provide you with, with some additional information. Um, any other questions? I think that was the only one that was in the chat box. Okay, um, then at this point, we, we will just say once again, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to share with you um, on this virtual showcase. We hope it was helpful.